Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Robinson. I work at Consensus Software R&D on cross-chain communications. And this talk is about the poly network hack. And so um, it's been really an interesting talk. I wish I had put um, a little bit slightly more time into it um, because um, as you'll see, um, there's all sorts of fun stuff in this. It's um, really quite amusing in some ways. So you will see various reports of the amount that the hack is, whether it's US $600 million or $610 million or some other amount. So the thing, of course, is cryptocurrencies go up and down in price. So the actual value of the um, hack depends on the day of the week and the minute of the day that you're trying to work out the value of the hack. So, um, yeah, so that's one thing to keep in mind. And so I think... If you ever, you know, are on Twitter, if you were on Twitter and you use Poly Network, I think seeing this message would have been a, oh dear, <laughs> moment. Um, yes, yeah, the, the thing that you're relying on has been hacked. Um, that would have to be pretty bad. So we're going to talk about this hack. And so we're going to start out by trying to work out what Poly Network is and who they are. And then try and work out how it actually works and then talk about the hack itself and then what happened after the hack and if you were designing a bridge what you might think about doing differently. So what is Poly Network? Um, so according to they themselves, Poly Network is a groundbreaking, heterogeneous, interoperable pro protocol alliance, which is well positioned to become a pillar of the NGI, um, where I googled it, and NGI stands for Next Generation Internet. Um, yeah, so that's what they claim. Um, and so again, from their website, so it's an interoperability between multiple chains. So they're trying to allow multiple chains to become some internet-like infrastructure. And they want to have allow authorized public blockchains to connect via their own network in some mechanism. So a communications between blockchain mechanism. And they're integrated into a whole stack of blockchains, some of which you've heard of, and others of which you would have not heard of, or at least I've not heard of. Um, and so the idea is that they then wanted companies to use their bridge, so companies to create applications on top of their bridge. And they've got a white paper that came out in May 2020. And so if you look on GitHub at, say, the ETH contracts um, uh, repo, um, you'll notice that you've got a set of people who are involved, um, of which Ed Edmund um, hasn't done any commits at all, um, and Daniel uh, Liu um, has done quite a few. And in fact, he would be the main developer. Um, so that is Sky, skying the H1. And so, um, I don't know, whenever I look at this, I then go, all right, well, so we've worked out who's involved. We've worked out actually who the main developer is based on who's done most commits. So let's click on their profile to try and work out who they are. And so um, the Skyling H1, um, they say they come from Shanghai, China. And if you look at the others, they also seem to come from Shanghai, China. So I think you can say that Poly Network is based in Shanghai. Um, Daniel also happens to have a um, website. And so, of course, you click on that website to try and again work out who they are. And the website um, doesn't exist at the moment. And so for those of us who've been on the internet for a while, we remember that there's the good old Wayback Machine that you can use to go back and have a look at websites that have been taken off the internet. And with the Wayback Machine, you can actually go a long way back in time. And I always go to the first entry because invariably people put up stuff on the first entry that they later might decide to remove. And so um, here's put a heap of information up 
um, including right down the bottom, it's got contact information. And um, so I think, you know, one of those is maybe a home phone number and another is a mobile phone number. Um, and you can see that um, back in 2012 era, um, or, you know, early on, uh, rather, it was in uh, Wuhan and has moved to Shanghai. So, um, so you know, we, I, I haven't gone to the effort of trying to bring up a photograph of um, the person, but, um, yeah, so we can find out a fair bit. So it's essentially um, the whole of Poly Network is probably five people and they live in Shanghai. So... What about, you know, how do they make money? So they do charge transaction fees, but the actual um, fee rate isn't shown on the website. And so if you try and do a transaction and start to move towards doing a transaction, they do show some fees and they say that they're to cover the gas costs on the various chains. So on the, say, the destination chain or the source chain. But um, I'm not sure that that's the actual true transaction fee. Um, so it was actually hard. And I didn't want to go and um, make a cross-chain transaction on, on the system myself. So I really don't know exactly what the transaction fees are. Though, interestingly, in um, one of the pages, of the website, um, they had future endeavors. And one of the top things is uh, work out the polychain transaction fee mechanism. So maybe they have part of the transaction fee mechanism. Um, but um, as you will see later on in the talk, they obviously have some mechanism because they're um, obviously making a fair bit of money. So how does Polynet work? work? Um, so this is a diagram out of their white paper. And so how um, they say it works is you have um, multiple chains. Um, and in this case, we've just got a source chain and a destination chain. But, you know, so we've got, say, a dozen or so blockchains, like, say, Ethereum mainnet and Bitcoin and Ontology and, you know, various other blockchains. And as well, you have a poly network chain, the poly chain. And so um, rather than having bridges one-to-one -one, um, between all of them in a, um, in a sort of a network where all are connected to all, the idea is that all of the chains connect to poly chain and then poly chain is connected to all of them. So any transaction goes via poly chain. And it um, uses... A, or they talk about it as a blockheader transfer mechanism, but I think really it's not a blockheader transfer as much as a Merkle, um, Merkle tree root um, transfer. So the tran transactions, the cross-chain transactions, get um, built up into a um, Merkle tree in the blockchain, and then the Mer that Merkle root is transferred across. And so the user sends a transaction, and then in, that goes into the, the cross-chain contract on the source chain. And then um, that transaction gets confirmed on the blockchain. And then a relayer picks up the um, Merkle root um, from that tree of um, transactions. And it submits that um, to the polychain. So then the polychain um, creates a Merkle tree of all of the Merkle routes from the various chains. So you can imagine that multiple transactions are coming in, one for each of the blockchains, and then they construct a Merkle tree on Polychain. And so that, that means that you've got this overall meta um, Merkle tree that you can use to um, verify um, transactions. And so that Merkle route from the overall Merkle tree gets relayed to a destination chain and um, is then trusted on the destination chain. So then the relayer can pick up the actual user's transaction and relay it to the appropriate destination chain. And then the um, transaction is executed on the destination chain. So to walk, you know, to think through the, this aggregated Merkle tree um, thing. So you can imagine, say, you might have, you know, multiple transactions in one time period on Ethereum. And 
they will be then constructed into a Merkle tree for Ethereum. So that Merkle route gets transferred across to the um, Poly network chain, and then and that gets put into a Merkle tree, and then you have an overall Merkle route. So I'm pretty sure that Merkle route is the thing that gets transferred to each of the blockchains. And so as long as you can then um, provide a Merkle proof, say that this transaction is included in the overall Merkle tree, then you can prove that you know, that transaction is valid. So on GitHub, Poly Network have this design diagram. And it's, I think it's, it's reasonably correct and up to date. Um, so the idea is you've got the ETH3 layer, which communicates with a ETH cross-chain manager contract. And it um, does sends in um, verification proofs and requests that transactions be executed. And then you have this business logic contract and so it can call into this cross-chain manager saying, hey, could you do a cross-chain call? And then it'll emit an event, which the relayer will pick up. Or if it's on the receiving side, the ETH relayer will have sent in this transaction with the proof, and then the cross-chain manager ends up calling out to the business logic contract. So the ETH manager uses something called the ETH cross-chain data chain to um, check out and verify that the proof is correct and um, also to um, hold data for making sure that you're not having a replay attack. So the idea is this cross-chain data contract is designed never to be upgraded, whereas the cross-chain manager contract is designed to be upgraded. So it's got more complex business logic, whereas this contract down here has got less complex business logic. And so within that ETH cross-chain manager contract, you've got um, this cross-chain call. And so the idea here is the business logic contract calls this function to um, have an event emitted and have that transaction added to that um, Merkle tree of transactions to be executed on a different chain. The verify header and execute transaction is called by a relayer and it is called with that proof and the raw headers. And the idea is that this then allows um, a transaction to be executed. And so the um, verify header and execute transaction calls execute cross-chain transaction. And so a cross execute cross-chain transaction is the actual function that executes the um, actual call. So it calls out to the code. However, cross-chain manager also has a set of other, um, other functions in it as well. And these you can think of as kind of management um, features. So one of them is ch change bookkeeper. And this is essentially changing the public keys that are gonna be used to verify um, the, um, the, the information coming across the, from the poly chain. So this is public keys used to verify remotely signed um, information. And also it in the um, contract inherits from or extends the upgradable um, ETH uh, cross-chain manager. And so it's got um, other things like pause and unpause the bridge and upgrade to new. So this is, hey, you should upgrade the system to a new cross-chain manager contract. And all of these functions interact with that cross-chain data contract, which is the one which which is you know, holding the core data that, um, and so it, it doesn't change, but the cross-chain manager changes. And so it holds things like public keys. And so in this cross-chain data contract, um, you've got um, so functions to manipulate your actual cross-chain public keys. You've got um, um, functions to manage um, transaction replay and to try and prevent that. And you've also um, got functions that relate to that transaction Merkle tree. And so you've, um, 
you've got a whole lot of essentially management functions or control functions. And so the, um, this contract though, is owned by the cross-chain manager. And so when you're seeing um, the um, only owner here, the owner is actually the cross-chain manager contract. There's also a lock proxy contract and it's got um, two functions. One is lock and one, the other one's unlock um, or two main functions. And so this is all about transferring assets to or from the bridge. And so if you're a contract and you want to um, transfer to another um, location, you call lock with your assets. Or if you're extracting um, value out of the bridge, you call unlock. And um, the, this can only be called though from the cross-chain manager, at least the, the unlock. So, Normally you have lock is called by a business logic contract and normally unlock is only called by the cross-chain manager. So what actually happened with the hack? And so I've um, used um, a few articles. So there's the slow mist ones. And also um, Kevin Fitcher um, has a great Twitter um, set of or tweets where he talks about the attack as well. Um, so what the attacker did was they sent a valid cross-chain message from ontology blockchain. And um, the speculation around why ontology as opposed to another blockchain is that um, maybe no one knows much about ontology. And so trying to investigate what's going on in the ontology blockchain is really hard for people because they just don't understand how the blockchain works. Anyway, what for independent of why that happened, um, the um, so they, they sent a standard transfer and um, that transfer ends up hitting the verify um, header and execute um, transaction, uh, function call rather, and it executed. And because um, the cross-chain transaction is valid, all of the checks passed. And then um, they um, called the execute cross-chain transaction um, from the verify header um, call. And so this is the part where the tricky stuff happens. So in the execute cross-chain transaction um, call, um, you've got this code here. And so what this is doing is it's got an, an address and you're calling, doing a call on that address. And then you're using ABI encode um, to um, create a, um, to, to bring together this bytes for and the um, actual parameters here. And so this is the function selector being created, and that is the parameters to the function. So um, if you look in here, you can see that you've got um, part of a um, method signature and then the name of the method. And then you've got here the arguments to the um, function, and you've also got tacked on the from contract and from blockchain. And so this is allowing the called code to do essentially um, application level authentication to make sure that they're only being called from contracts they're expecting. And so the attacker wants to call to the ETH cross-chain um, data contract, and they want to call the, the um, function to update the um, public keys. And so what they need to do is have a function selector that is the same as um, this put, you know, as the function selector for the um, put the public keys. And so that function selector works out to be that value there. And so what they did is they um, called the ETH, ETH cross-chain um, this method using, um, sorry, um, yeah, so they called into this execute cross-chain transaction, um, supplying that me underscore method parameter. And so they had to brute force to find a value um, that would hash to this value, given this overall function signature. So they came up with that value there, 
And so now they've got a collision. And so finding a collision for a 32 bit or four byte value is trivial. So um, yeah, it wouldn't have been that hard to find that. So then the attacker um, sends that valid transaction, as I said, to ontology blockchain, and they're sending it to that ETH cross-chain data address. And they've got the destination method as that hacked method name. And then that verify executes correctly, which calls the execute. And then um, the cross-chain managers execute function um, calls the cross-chain data um, func um, contract and calls the set, um, update the public keys. And now because cross-chain data is owned by the cross-chain manager, all the passes check. So the only owner checks out okay. And so now the attacker has their own key as the trusted cross-chain key. And so um, the attacker um, can then call the verify header and execute transaction function, which calls the execute cross-chain transaction that will call into lock proxies unlock function. And they can then just um, transfer all of the assets. And um, the request is trusted because the cross-chain verification key has been set up correctly and the lock proxy trusts and executes the request because it's coming from the cross-chain manager. And from um, Slow Mist, they um, showed the estimates of how much money was transferred out. So um, that would have been a bit of a blow if you um, saw that happening if you were Poly Network. So they um, did, a, did some responsible dis disclosure soon after the attack saying, hey, we've been hacked, which is really good. And um, they then appealed to miners and other um, entities to blacklist um, some addresses. And um, they did multiple um, tweets with various addresses that they wanted people to block. And then they posted this saying that they'd take legal action and urged the hackers to return the assets or else. Um, and then um, Binance, said, well, look, we can try, but um, the, um, yeah, there's only so much we can do. Um, Tether, on the other hand, um, they froze the assets. And so uh, I think this is an interesting one for um, decentralization. Um, to be able to freeze assets sort of says that, well, um, Tether isn't that, is, you know, centralised, whereas, um, say, other blockchain systems that are decentralised, there's only so much you can do. So Poly Network then um, released this and tweeted um, this text. Um, and so essentially, you know, we want to establish communications, but more... Um, law enforcement's going to come after you because you've stolen $500 million or $600 million. So, um, you know, let's try and work this out. Um, and then um, within a day of the hack, um, Slow Mist um, did an analysis of what had happened. And then, um, and then the Poly Network people did a transaction um, on the uh, on Ethereum, and as the input data, they used a message uh, or they wrote a message, and so I, I think this is really interesting because um, this is a way of you know me saying, hey, this is definitely me. You can see I've signed it with my private key, and here's a message to you, and so everyone can read it, and um, it's recorded on the blockchain, and, and so. Um, then the attacker started returning the money. And so they, um, you know, initially returned um, $4 million. And then um, a bit later, they returned, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. And um, then they um, did, did more. Um, and they started, the Poly Network team referred to the attacker as Mr. White Hat. And you know, thank them for returning assets, and hope that they can keep on returning assets, um, which is you know a, a curious thing to be happening. 
And so then um, Poly Network announced a roadmap out of the situation that, you know, we're going to do these patches, we're going to upgrade, we're going to relaunch the network, we're going to get the assets back from Mr. White Hat to everyone. And um, then we're going to resume services and things are just going to keep on happening. And then um, the fix that um, Poly Network put in um, was they added a, set, added a set of allow lists or otherwise known as whitelisting of source addresses that um, cross-chain calls could come from. And they um, added a set of addresses that you could send um, value to. So when you're doing a call in that cross-chain function call mechanism, they li limited which, fun which contracts could be called. And they also limited which method names, which function names could be called as well. So um, then um, what, four days or six days later, about a week later, um, they um, announced that they're going to give $500,000 to Mr. White Hat. And um, they also announced that they're going to have a $500,000 bug bounty program as well. Then on the 17th, um, they say that, you know, we're not going to hold Mr. White Hat legally responsible. And not only that, we're going to ask him or her um, to be chief security advisor um, and that they're definitely sending that $500,000 to them. Um, and they've got no objections. I don't have any qualms about this person. And then um, what, on the 19th, um, so a week and a half later, um, one of the applications that's sitting on top of Poly Network says, you know, we've relaunched and everything's good and um, everything's being restored. Um, and then um, I, th then there was this message from the attacker. And so this is another one of these um, messages inside of an Ethereum transaction in the Ethereum transaction data. And, um, you know, it's one of these big, long um, rants. It's interesting to have a look at some of the um, English language usages. And um, even um, so the fact that they've used underscore around something to essentially make it into italics. Um, and so, yeah, that's, it's interesting reading in itself. Um, um, yeah, very interesting. Um, and then you might notice that um, they refer to another transaction. So here's another transaction that we should all look at. And so if you look at that transaction, um, there's um, another big long um, discussion or rant, I don't know, anyway, talking about all sorts of things. Um, and so you might recall Tether froze um, $33 million worth of assets. So then um, about a couple, two and a bit weeks later, they unfroze the assets. So who is the attacker? Um, so um, various security teams have claimed to have tracked down all the associated blockchain addresses and they've worked out the IP address of the attacker as well. And with that blockchain address, um, you should be a, a policing force would be able to work out the person's identity in a pre pretty straightforward way. It's just going to be a matter of at some point they would have transferred some fiat onto the blockchain or transferred some um, from blockchain to fiat. And so it's just a matter of following the um, addresses, either Ethereum or other blockchain networks to find an a exchange that exchanges fiat for um, the blockchain cryptocurrency and then the policing agency just goes to that company and says who is that person and um, that's that so what can we learn from all of this you know what if we look at the code and look at the fixes and look at what, what the hack was what can we be learning from all of this um so Yes, yeah, so what can we learn from this? Well, one thing that I, I look at is that um, they're mixing up their management or control and so their keys and configuration with their data, so their normal transactions. 
And so mixing up your control flow with your data flow is never a good idea. Um, it invariably leads to a world of pain. And these guys have certainly found a $600 million world of pain. So having that control functionality separated and maybe controlled by some sort of multi-sig wallet um, would be good and not via that cross-chain management contract. Um, I think um, another thing is that they've merged their protocol layers and so it makes it harder to reason about the actual cross-chain um, system. And so if they had a separate cross-chain messaging, cross-chain function call and cross-chain application layer, I think it would have made their lives easier. And um, yeah, so I think that um, that would have made it more clear what the protocol interactions were. So they did put in that allow listing, white listing. Um, and so that's a good control mechanism. Another thing they could have done is they could have required any contract they were going to call to have, say, to implement an interface that might have been, I am a cross chain and it returns bool. And so essentially they do a call to that um, function. And if it works, then it's great. And if it reverts, then they know that it's not a cross chain compatible contract. Um, and another um, problem with the whole system is it's not atomic. So you could have an update occur on a source chain and not on a destination chain. And there's, you know, you wouldn't detect it easily. You'd have to um, have the customer complain to you. And so not having atomic updates across chains is not a good thing. So in summary, um, the poly network hack was caused by an attacker who exploded a flaw in the code. So it wasn't a leak of a private key, it was a bug in the code. And that flaw in the code allowed the attacker to change the key that was used to verify information coming across the cross-chain transactions. Um, so the presenting problem is a permissioning issue, but really the root cause of it is mixing up that control management flow and the data processing. Um, so there should have been separation there. Additionally, the transfers aren't atomic, so that's going to lead to some undesirable issues as well. Um, and I think for myself, what's happened after is, is interesting. Um, so, um, yeah, so I, I will, I can see there's questions in the chat and I will come to them, but before I do come to them, so next, um, in, in the coming weeks, we've got a whole stack of talks coming up and we may even have some additional talks in the middle as well. So in two weeks time, I'm talking about the GPACT ERC20 bridge. And then Raghavendra is gonna be talking in October, late October about state expiry. And then we've got um, Anthony uh, Denya is gonna be talking about MEV attacks and how you can mitigate them using Hyperledger BESU. We've got Roberto talking about formal verification and QBFT consensus protocol. We're gonna have a networking event. And then back in, in January, I'm gonna talk about advanced solidity. In the midst of all this, we may have a talk on storage costs and various ways of um, approaches to minimizing storage costs in Ethereum. And also I'm working with someone on doing a talk on NFTs and the technical challenges of running in an NFT blockchain. So let's have a look at the questions. Uh, Okay, um, so a myth um, said um, that, um, so why, was, why did Poly Network publish their source code um, on GitHub? Is this the norm? And is it something that could be reverse engineered from the binary contract if not published? So there's a few things going on here. Um, one is that in the blockchain space, yes, it is normal to publish your code. Um, Another thing is that if you're asking people to put money into a contract and use your contract, they'll want to know how it executes, how it's going to work. And the best way is to have it on the blockchain, um, rather have it public. The other thing, of course, is as well, that even if you don't have it public, people can reverse engineer it. 
And, um, you know, if, if people are interested, they will. But I think the really big thing is that unless you've got your code public, people are not going to probably trust it as much. Um, and um, I don't know, does anyone have any thoughts or comments on that? Okay. All right, the next one. Um, yes, uh, and Joey said um, about PSTN um, telephony systems. Very true, very true. Yes, having your, and this is actually um, exactly um, where I was, where I first learned that thing as well. I did a master's of telecommunications engineering a very long time ago. And that was one of the things that you never should do. Um, and thank you, Mark. There's, and it's even got a name, Kirchhoff's Principle. How's that? Learn a new thing every day. Yeah. Um, on, on the open source, the, having the contract available, that's also useful for security analysis so that you can actually offer a bug bounty and um, yeah, have people analyze your code. And maybe someone could have spotted that there's a security. and in this case, actually, that's probably exactly what happened, it seems, because if this person had have been not returned the money, um, the situation would have been very different. Well, as well, if they had have um, done open disclosure and everything, they might have got a bug bounty of $5,000 or something, whereas they hold them <laughs> hold $600 million <laughs> for ransom and they get half a million dollars transferred to a Bitcoin address. And I was... I, I was going to track down that Bitcoin address to try and see whether they um, had actually done anything with that um, with that address, and I couldn't. But curiously, um, if you look here, I'll re um, share my screen, and so yeah, where was it? So there was yeah, this is the exploiter. And um, what I noticed was, so if we go to, if you go to the exploiter, isn't it incredible? You have heist, exploit. So I hope that that's never next to an Ethereum address located, you know, associated with my name. Um, but um, yeah, so one, isn't that incredible that you have all of this? But the other thing is, look at all the transactions. And it's not that these have just, you know, stopped a long time ago. There's a whole heap of these transactions have been happening quite recently. Um, and as well, if you want to read interesting stuff, have a, have a look at any of their transactions that are sent to self. And um, the ones that are sent to self are the ones that um, you click more and then view as UTF-8. And they're the ones that have got all the messages in them. Um, yeah, it's, it's curious. It, I'm sure someone could write a book or something. Um, yeah, yeah, and I, I'm so as far as, so, so one would think this is an inside job. Yeah, I don't know. I would have thought it would have done a massive amount of reputational damage to Poly Network. I don't, you know, and I don't think it matters how much um, they try and say, hey, we've got a whole stack of security auditors have said our code's good now. Um, you know, it, surely it's damaging. And there are so many bridge technologies out there for doing a similar sort of thing. Um, yeah. And another thing, though, that I learned from this is if, if, you know, so though it was hard to work out the transaction fees, the fact that they could offer a half a million dollar reward and then separately have other half a million dollar bug bounties, um, it shows that they must have raked in quite a lot of money over time. Interesting about the um, tether freezing the money. Now, uh, obviously, there's no guarantee that a, a, a DeFi product is, is going to be decentralized just because it's running on a decentralized blockchain, right? Obviously, that's quite simple to, I mean, say, say you're doing an escrow service, well, you're getting money from the escrow service, you control it, you're offering a service to two other people, you know, it's it's centralized and you you own that service. But um, yeah, especially because Tether 
you know, um, sells itself as a as 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 as, as a coin as a, as a, as a but if it's it's obviously not decentralized. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 very true. Yes, obviously, it's it, otherwise they couldn't have just put a stop. All right, so we've got a whole stack of questions coming through. Good, good that I've, I've picked a topic that everyone's interested in. Hey, um, yeah, I think there's a question there about that tether. How tether would freeze those specific coins? Yeah, that's well, a. Isn't it, uh, well, isn't it straightforward? Because on Ethereum, the ERC twenty contract that maintains the ERC twenty token records who own like which address on what number of tokens. So burning tokens is very easy for the ERC contract to do, ERC 20 contract to do. Whereas if you had a UTXO or a EUTXO model, it doesn't work the same way, right? Yeah, it, I think it's going to come down to how the contract was written. So maybe their ERC 20 might even have some extra magic in it to freeze certain addresses or something. I mean, that wouldn't be too hard to add, would it? If you look at the standard open Zeppelin contracts for ERC20, they have a burn function built into them. So like burn functions in ERC20 contracts are not an uncommon thing. Yeah. So I think what people need to realize is that on Ethereum, the ERC2 controls the ERC20 contract, controls your balances for that particular token. Yeah, you're right. So you're saying that you could... Um you could do a that maybe the administrators of um, that could do a burn maybe yeah I I would want to have a look at um, I mean I guess as we all know it's all just out there on Ethereum mainnet and all you got to do is find the tether contract and find that address within the tether contract and see what transactions have been done related to it and um, then we'll find out whether they did a burn or did some sort of freeze or what they did. Um, okay, so Roberto, so Cliff said, um, what are the best practices for doing a code scan, dev, sec, security op, ops um, sort of best practice? Well, that's a really good question. So I know there are a variety, including Consensus has got a security auditing um, group. Um, so that's obviously one thing that can be done. Multiple sets of eyes on the code is another good thing, not just have one set at one person write something. Um, trying to have a separation of concerns is another good thing to do as well. Um, and trying to not have everything all in one contract. Trying to simplify what's on chain. Um, that, you know, if at all possible, having as little on chain as possible and only having your core business logic um, is a good thing to do. Also, try and not write it yourself. Like, use Open Zeppelin or use some. If you want to write an ERC20, don't go write it from scratch. Go and use a one that's already been battle tested and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, Roberto said, Why did they need to brute force the function selector? So, um, the function selector for the um, call to update the um, public key was that big long name followed by brackets bytes. Um, so the function selector is the truncated hack 256 of the method name or function name and the um, parameters. And so um, the parameters was brackets bytes. And so that truncated hash comes to a certain value. And then um, in, the, um, in that execute um, function, execute call, cross-chain call, it um, had a method name and then it combined that with a certain parameter set. Um, and so the idea is that they needed to come up with a function name that when combined with that parameter set would hash to the same value as the update the public keys function call. Um, does that make sense? And that's because that's how functions are referred to in Ethereum by their by their key. Yeah, not by not by name. So it's exactly, like, it's like when you compile a normal program, a, a function becomes a pointer in memory. That's kind of the similar concept, I guess. Yeah, if if you have a look at, I did a talk on the EVM back about a year and a bit ago, 
and that talks through function selectors and such like and how function selectors are used within um, the EVM and you know within the um, bytecode. Um, okay, Tether. Yes, you need to, yeah, so Feng Yang is, or Fei Yang is saying, um, just because something's been open source, don't trust it. That's true. Anyone can um, open source something and bang it up um, on GitHub. Um, it does need to be checked out. Yep, okay. Oh, and trying to formally verify would be a good idea too, said by Frank. Um, very true, very, very true, Frank. Um, yeah. Open source can also be a, a source of attack, though, as well. Um, I think there was one recently that was an attack where they submitted a change into the open source that that um, that somehow got in and then allowed them to attack the network. So. Oh yeah, well, this is very true. You've got to. I mean, a, a great one is um, OpenSSL, which is used all over the place, and they're always got to watch out for people who do pull requests um, that are malicious. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, uh, so anyway, um, what else can I say? So there's a whole lot going through there. Obviously, one thing that would have been awesome, and so um, if um, the um, Sky, what was it, Skyling, um, anyway, the, the person who, did, who wrote the contracts Originally, let's work, remember what their name was. Yeah, so um, Daniel Liu, uh, Skying Lee H1. If you're um, interested in um, doing a talk, and um, I'm sure people have got lots of questions, so uh, pl please feel free to get in contact. All right, anyway, um, so. <laughs> Um, yeah, sort of. Um, all right. So talk to everyone in um, two weeks time. Um, have a great uh, rest of your day, everyone. Talk later. Bye bye. Thanks, Peter. Bye. Thanks, Peter. Great talk. Thank you, Peter. Thanks. Thanks very much, Peter. Cheers.